Welcome to another mythology video. To make sense of transcendental numbers is considered to be very tough and no YouTube video or other attempt at popularization I know of even gets close to a really convincing argument why some particular number is transcendental, let alone anything beyond that. Today's video is my best shot at giving an introduction to transcendental numbers that is both in depth and at the same time accessible to anybody with a bit of common sense. This introduction will be powered by the remarkably simple constructions at the core of the theory of infinite sets developed by the great mathematician Georg Cantor. Now the experts among you will probably be familiar with some of these constructions but I'm pretty sure that even for you there will be a couple of pleasant plot twists that you won't see coming. So stick around and please at the end let me know what worked for you and what didn't. Okay, quick intro to transcendental numbers and why we care about them. Here we go. When I talk about numbers in this video, in the first instance I mean the real numbers. And as usual I'll often represent the standard set of numbers by the number line. To start with they are the integers and the rational numbers. The numbers that can be expressed as fractions of integers. In fact, for a long time people believed that all numbers are rational and it's actually quite natural to do so. Just think about it. Here are the numbers that are multiples of one half, here are the ones that are multiples of one fourth, here are the ones that are multiples of one eighth, and so on. These numbers get as narrowly spaced as you wish and so it's pretty easy to see that no matter how tiny an interval I pick on the number line there will always be infinitely many rational numbers contained in it. And so to start with there is really no reason to suspect that there exist irrational numbers numbers that cannot be written as fractions. But of course you probably all know that root 2 and the golden ratio are irrational numbers. These two irrationals as well as the fractions are examples of algebraic numbers. Those are the numbers that come up naturally in algebra as solutions to polynomial equations <laughs> with integer coefficients. For example, the fraction 22 over 7 is the solution to this linear equation there and root 2 is one of the two solutions of this quadratic equation. I just randomly picked the polynomial equation at the bottom there. Uh, it's got one real solution which is approximately minus 1.061 and so on. The algebraic numbers have a number of amazing properties. For example, just like the real numbers themselves and the rational numbers, they form an algebraic structure called a field. Also, all numbers without exception that can be written as radical expressions by combining integers using plus, minus, times, divided and roots like these are algebraic. On the other hand, there are algebraic numbers that cannot be written as such rooty expressions. That the algebraic numbers have these properties is really quite miraculous and not obvious at all. Definitely worth one or two separate videos I think. In any case, a very natural question to ask is whether there are any numbers that are not algebraic. In other words, whether there are transcendental numbers, numbers that transcend the world generated by algebra. Okay, let's warm up with a truly ingenious construction of an irrational number, a number that cannot be written as a fraction, using some of Georg Cantor's ideas. I start with this grid here, which is made up of all possible pairs of integers. From here we get all the fractions like this. Well, apart from the real fractions, we also get some nonsense fractions with zeros in the denominators. Now, we'll do something which at first glance may seem impossible. We'll make up a list that contains every rational number exactly once. Cantor's ingenious trick that makes this possible is to simply walk along this spiral here. Right, so we go and note down each rational number the first time we come across it. So start with 0 divided by 0, that's not a number so let's move on. 0 divided by 1, that's 0 which makes 0 the first rational number on our list. Next comes 1 divided by 1, so 1 is the second number on our list. Forget about 1 divided by 0, next is minus 1 here and then there's 0 but we already listed 0 so we move on to minus 1 divided by what? minus 1, that's 1 which we've also got already. Now skipping ahead the next number we have not seen yet is minus 1 half, okay, then 1 half, then 2 and so on. 
Now let's write down all the rational numbers in decimals. You all know that some numbers have two decimal expansions, one ending in a tail of zeros and the other in a tail of nines. For example the number one can also be written as 0.999 and so on. Actually, <laughs> it seems that the vast majority of people watching YouTube are not familiar with the fact that 1 is equal to 0.999 and so on. And that the majority of those who are aware of this basic fact are really violently opposed to it. If you don't believe me, or even if you do, for a real eye-opener I recommend browsing through some of the 5000 comments on my 1 is equal to 0.99 video aimed at primary school kids. Anyway, whenever there is a choice between two different decimal expansions for one of the numbers on our list, we'll use the decimal expansion that terminates in zeros. Now, highlight this infinite diagonal of digits here. Right? Using this diagonal we can straight away write down a number that is irrational. So we'll make a copy of the diagonal for this and change all the digits in the circles. Here we change all the zeros to ones and all the other digits to zeros. The new number that we get this way differs from every number on our list in one position each. For example, it differs from the sixth number on the list in the six digits here, they're different. It differs from the fifth number in the fifth digit and so on. And this means that the new number is really different from all the numbers we've listed, right? But we've listed all rational numbers and therefore the new number has to be irrational. The fact that made this neat construction possible was that the rational numbers can be listed like this. Infinite sets of numbers that can be listed like this are called countably infinite. As part of such an infinite list we enumerate the elements of the countably infinite set with the natural numbers. Um, this also shows that in a sense there are exactly as many natural numbers as there are elements in any countably infinite set. Just think about this for a moment. A listing like this shows that there are as many rational numbers as natural numbers. Now if you see this for the first time don't you think that this is really amazing? Anyway. If you give me any countably infinite listable set, then I can make up a number outside this set using Cantor diagonalization, which is what our nifty construction method is often called. There. And the thing is, and I'll show you in a second, the algebraic numbers are, just like the rational numbers, countably infinite. This means party time. <laughs> we can use Cantor diagonalization to construct a number that is not algebraic, a number that is transcendental. A very important ingredient in listing the algebraic numbers is the fact that a quadratic equation can have at most two solutions and a degree 21 equation like the one at the bottom there can have at most 21 real solutions and so on. Okay, here then is a quick sketch of how you can list the algebraic numbers. We've already listed the fractions that is the solutions to all linear equations with integer coefficients a, b. Now don't get hung up too much on the details of my method of listing the algebraic numbers. What I do here is pretty arbitrary and there are lots and lots of different ways of listing the algebraic numbers. In fact, it's not very hard to make up your own method if your life should ever depend on it. You know, it might happen. Okay, after we've listed the rational numbers, we list the quadratic irrationals and these are the solutions of quadratic equations with three integer coefficients a, b and c. Now just like we systematically inspected a 2D grid here of all integer pairs from the inside out to cycle through all fractions, we can use a 3D grid of all integer triples a, b, c to cycle through all possible quadratic equations. Okay. For every quadratic equation that we come across in this way, we add those among its solutions to our new list that are neither fractions and therefore already part of the first list there, nor quadratic irrationals that we've already seen in this second process. And in this way we list all the quadratic irrationals including root 2 and the golden ratio for example. Okay, now we repeat this process for all cubic irrationals and so on. Now we compact all this together and now this 2D grid contains every algebraic number exactly once. 
So now we've got a final nifty trick. We string up this grid like this and simply list the algebraic numbers as we come across them while walking along the blue path. As I said, this is just one way to list the algebraic numbers. There are infinitely many others. Cantor diagonalization translates the one I've chosen into a transcendental number that starts out like this. Now pinpointing this transcendental number is not the end of the usefulness of Cantor's diagonalization trick. We can also use it to figure out how many transcendental numbers there are. Again, Cantor's diagonalization trick lets us find a real number outside any countably infinite set of numbers. What about the real numbers themselves? Are the real numbers also a countably infinite set? Well, obviously not, because if they were countable, diagonalization would produce a real number outside the set of real numbers. Well, that's obviously not possible. That would be a really transcendental number. <laughs> okay, anyway, it's not possible to construct a real number outside the real numbers. And so since this is not possible, this means that the real numbers cannot be listed, that they form an uncountably infinite set. Well, let's have this sink in for a second. Uncountably infinite. That's obviously a larger infinity than countably infinite, right? Okay, so the real numbers are uncountably infinite. And the algebraic numbers are countably infinite. What about the transcendental numbers? Are they countably infinite or uncountably infinite? Well, since the transcendental numbers complement the countably infinite set of algebraic numbers to the uncountably infinite set of real numbers, it should be uncountably infinite itself, right? And here's actually a chance for you to show this in the comments, just based on what I've said so far. See how you go with this. Anyway, let me show you something stronger. I want to show you that a countably infinite set of numbers like the rational numbers or the algebraic numbers are vanishingly small when compared to an uncountably infinite set like the real numbers, the transcendental numbers or the irrational numbers. Here's a nice argument that illustrates this in the case of the rational numbers. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll label the rational numbers with the natural numbers using our list there. So the rational number 0 gets labeled with a 1. Next, 1 gets labeled with a 2, and so on. Take a segment of length 1, half it, and put it on the number line centered at the number labeled 1. Half the remaining interval, and put it on the number line centered at the number labeled 2 and so on. So what we've done is to encase the rational numbers into a set of length 1. This means, and this is made rigorous in a branch of maths called measure theory, that the set of rationals has length or measure less than 1. But then the whole construction still works if we start out with any shorter segment and chop it up. And now, since we can make these segments arbitrarily small, the conclusion is that the rationals have lengths or measure zero. So in a sense, they're not even there, although you think they're there. Hmm. Well, of course, the same is true for any other countably infinite set of numbers, like the algebraic numbers. Every countably infinite set of numbers has measure zero. Hmm. Zero lengths, that's a pretty strange conclusion, isn't it? But when you think about it, not any stranger than some of the other things we've seen so far, like that the set of algebraic numbers is no larger than the set of natural numbers. What all this also implies is that if we restrict our attention to some finite interval and pick a random number inside this interval, in a paradoxical but very precise sense, you have a zero chance of picking any algebraic number. Or what's saying the same, you can be pretty certain to have picked a transcendental number. So what about numbers like pi or e? Well, since almost all numbers are transcendental, you'd expect both pi and e to be transcendental. And that's actually true, but it turns out to be super tough to prove this and is really beyond what I can do in a video like this. But just for fun, here's such a proof. So this is four pages of super dense mathematical pain. Okay, now here I just have to mention that proving in 1882 that pi is transcendental resolved a problem that already puzzled the ancient Greeks. 
pi being transcendental implies that squaring the circle is impossible. So, given a circle, it is impossible to construct a square of the same area just using an ideal mathematical ruler and compass. Anyway, since even getting close to proofs for the transcendence of pi, e or any other number we are obsessing over is really out of reach, what's the next best thing we can aim for? Okay, well, the dots in the transcendental number I made up for you are the same sort of dots as in 3.14159265355 and so on. These dots only make sense in context. On the other hand, it would be great to be able to display a decimal number with a simple pattern of digits and show that this number is transcendental. Liouville's constant, discovered by the great French mathematician Joseph Liouville, just preceding Cantor's ideas, fits the bill. This number is really an ocean of zeros with isolated islands of ones at the one factorials, two factorials, three factorials, etc. digits. Since this number features strings of zeros of arbitrary length, it clearly does not have a repeating tail and is therefore an irrational number. It is one of the earliest numbers that was proven to be transcendental and in textbooks it is usually portrayed as the transcendental number whose transcendence is easiest to prove. Having said that, I think the way to pinpoint a specific transcendental number and prove its transcendence that I showed you in this video is definitely much easier to explain and understand than any of the proofs of the transcendence of Liouville's constant that I've seen. Having said that, the original main aim of this video was to come up with a nice YouTubeable proof for the transcendence of the Liouville constant. I actually managed to put together such a proof, but I really think it deserves its own video sometime. And so this is it for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. As usual, let me know in the comments what did and what did not work for you.